Matrix is a system, Neo. That system is our enemy. But when you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters. The very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system, that they will fight to protect it. Hello and welcome. This is Paul Sandhu coming to you with another episode of Question Flatter Series. I had not intended to do this as a series, but it looks like I'm going to have to because there is so much information that needs to be covered. It is basically impossible to do so in one video. But I do want to mention at this point that this series uh, is not necessarily trying to prove uh, that we live on a flat plane. The Earth is flat, not a circular globe spinning madly through space following the sun like a serpent chasing its own tail. Okay, so that is not the intent here. So the intent of this series is to actually examine the models, the astronomical models of uh, our solar system, of the Earth, the movements of the Earth, and of the Sun. In particular, we won't go into galaxies and all that, you know, that's uh, no need to do that. But when we begin to look at the information that we are given with a critical eye and to analyze that information, okay, logically and applying some very common reasoning to the observations that we make as to certain phenomena that are very much a part of life on Earth, such as the seasons, and to see how they are explained in this, uh, you know, solar system model with the massive sun in, at the center and the other planetary or and other bodies orbiting around it, then it then this model falls apart of its own self okay there's no need to do anything more you just look at it critically then then the only conclusion one can draw is no this is impossible so either what we are observing with our eyes is wrong or this model is wrong so that's the purpose here okay is to basically refresh people's minds or to people who have never really studied it to 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 uh, take information <clears throat> not that something i am making up or uh, but just what is uh in the mainstream and uh, education from uh, you know what we're taught in school and universities from organizations such as nasa and uh, let the information disprove itself that is the intent okay let's just briefly take a look at the state of physics in the 21st century uh, modern physics kind of evolved out of uh, the old uh, middle ages alchemy so in its uh, it started taking shape i would say in the 16th century onwards and uh, we are where we are today after about four or five hundred years now you would think that by this time the scientists would have figured everything out and here's an article from uh, january 8 2017 and uh, this is uh, your newswire.com and i have put a link in there and uh, it says scientists admit everything they know about physics is likely wrong now to most people this may come as a surprise you know that they think that this is the first scientist who's saying that no actually physicists have come to a conclusion um, a lot of physicists never actually bought the Einsteinian hypotheses and all those theories that he promoted and uh, but particularly in the 1920 I mean the late uh, part of the 20th century and in the early 20th century most physics uh, physicists have now come to the conclusion that you know this uh, particle physics model it does not really explain anything like the model with the atoms and molecules and such okay so that's why this has uh, sort of evolved like uh, modern physics evolves out of uh, you know middle ages alchemy uh, modern physics has sort of evolved into something which they are trying to evolve it into quantum physics uh, which again with these uh, quarks and uh, neutrinos and other exotic particles uh, but at the same time now these scientists have also come to a conclusion that uh, even that is not sufficient because that really doesn't prove anything also so now they have sort of taken a step uh, towards moving away from uh, particle physics altogether into let's call it information physics that everything consists of information not necessarily of particles that's where things are headed now this may come as a surprise to them but uh, the bible already told us that uh, thousands of years ago that that's what everything consists of is information if you read john chapter 1 verse 1 it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god so god himself is information okay 
that's what everything consists of is information which is a topic which is too uh, deep and uh, wide to cover here but something which is very dear to me and I will definitely be speaking about it in the future now here let's just uh, also while we are at it take a quick look at uh, uh, something that Tesla said okay when people think of scientists you know they always mention like Einstein as something like a great inventor I, Einstein invented absolutely nothing all he invented was his, uh, you know, ridiculous and phony theories of relativity. But this is what Nikola had to, Tesla had to say about gravity and uh, such other things, which uh, scientists, uh, you know, secretly do not believe in. But they have to toe the party line. Therefore, they keep, uh, you know, supporting uh, these uh, fake theories and hypotheses. Earth is a realm. It is not a planet. It is not an object. Therefore, it has no edge. Earth is a realm. It is not a planet. It is not an object. Therefore, it has no edge. Earth would be more easily defined as a system in, as system environment. Earth is also a machine. It is a Tesla coil. The sun and moon are powered wirelessly with the electromagnetic field, the ether. Okay. So according to Tesla, sun is not like a big ball of fire with nuclear explosions, you know, happening inside it all the time. That is not what the sun is. The sun is electric. This field also suspends the celestial spheres with electromagnetic levitation. Electromagnetic levitation disproves gravity because the only force you need to counter is the electromagnetic force, not gravity. The stars are attached to the firmament. This is Nikola Tesla. Okay, so topic for today is going to be why is it that the sun, the talus, is hottest at noontime? Okay, let's take a look and see what we can learn in my last uh, video I mentioned that you know there are uh, two models of the solar system that are not necessarily taught separately but very deceptively they are both presented to us simultaneously depending depending on what the context is okay for example if you're if you're looking at the model of the solar system in context of the origin of uh, you know the cosmos then the sun is very very big this is for example on uh, this uh, website here which is uh, about the relative size of the earth jupiter and the sun okay so we can read things like the diameter of the, of the earth if it's one then the diameter of the sun is 100 actually it says closer to 110 Okay, the surface area of the earth being one the surface area of the sun is 10 times 10,000 times bigger and that is an important figure, you know, if the surface area of the sun is 10,000 times bigger and uh, its volume is a million times bigger, then, uh, of course, the energy that it is blasting out is going to be, and I guess blasting perhaps is the right word if this is all done through nuclear uh, explosions, then the energy that is being blasted or radiated outwards, it is going to, of course, exceed the size of its own dimensions by a multiple of 10, 20, 100,000, maybe, you know, a, a, but a big multiple of its own dimensions, which means that the energy, this torrent of energy that comes from the sun, it has to exceed the width and dimensions of the earth by hundreds and thousands. And what the problem that creates is, you know, a lot of these explanations for these phenomena depend on what's called the angle at which the sun's energy arrives at certain points of the earth okay as we shall see in some videos i'm going to play that the sun if it is really that massive then the only way for this energy to arrive anywhere on the earth is in the form of direct energy that it is going to hit every area of the earth head on and direct it directly never at an angle here's some more information here you know nasa's uh, corny cosmicopia this is a website and it says how much power does the sun produce and we are told the sun's output and again this is to confirm from official sources how big this bubble of energy that i talked about last video is in which our earth is situated okay very close to the earth i might add in the in the solar system itself and uh, the reach of the sun's energy output which extends beyond the boundaries of the last known bodies in the solar system 
way beyond it, we are told, that the bubble that envelops the whole solar system of the energy of the sun, it is massive. And here's one uh, figure that we are given from the NASA website. The sun's output is 3.8 times to times 10 to the power 33 ergs per second, or about five times 10 to the power 23 horsepower. How much is that? It is enough energy to melt a bridge of ice two miles wide, one mile thick, and extending the entire way from the Earth to the Sun in one second. Okay. Continuing on, here's another website, The Sun and Its Energy. And this is a very important information in this article here that I want to bring to your attention. And this is going to be shown to you on a, on a graphic image as well so that we can understand what it is that they are telling us, okay? So it gives us different information about the sun and the energy it produces again. And then it says the sun radiates energy equally in all direction. Just like I told you, it's a spherical object. So it's it's radiating an energy 360. And it's creating this giant bubble of energy in which all of the objects of the solar system, the Earth being one, are contained. And uh, the inner planets like Mercury, Venus, and Mars, and, and Earth in particular, they are very much close to the surface of the Earth, even though we are told that the Earth is 150 million kilometers away still given the size of the sun and the amount of energy it produces it is very much in the neighborhood okay it would be like if you went to a smelting you know uh, where they melt steel or something you know the earth would be just barely outside of the mouth of that furnace so how much energy would be coming past it well that should give you an idea anyhow the sun radius energy equally in all directions and the earth intercepts and receives part of this energy the power flux reaching the Earth, the top of the Earth's atmosphere is about 1400 watts per square meter. This measure simply means that on average one square meter on the side of the Earth, now listen to this very carefully. This measure simply means that on average one square meter on the side of the Earth facing the Sun. Okay? So any side that is facing the Sun, the Sun, the Earth, the daylight side is obviously the one side of the Earth that is facing it. And as we shall see, the face is 180 degrees from top to bottom, okay? This measure simply means that on average, one square meter on the side of the Earth facing the sun receives energy from the sun equal to that from 14 100 light, wall, watt light bulbs every second. Okay, that's the type of energy that is reaching the Earth from the Sun. And this is on the entire side that is facing the Sun. Okay. Now, so this again, you know, I read these in, this information out to you to uh, show you that we are told about this incredible size of the sun and the massive amount of energy it is producing and the massive quantity of this energy that is reaching our earth however something strange happens okay now when we go along to begin to explain you know these phenomenon of uh, day night hot cold seasons etc this is what happens look at this uh, cartoon on the screen on the nasa website okay it says energy difference between the equator and the poles what has happened here? That very, very massive sun, which was allegedly so big that it's a million times in volume, the surface area is 10,000 miles, it's producing enough energy to, build, to melt a two mile wide bridge of ice, which is 93 million miles long in one second. What happened to the sun? You know, they make it look funny with those sunglasses and all that, but there is a very deliberate intent behind it to distract you because this is not to scale okay this is nowhere near to scale because they need you to believe that certain parts of the earth are going to be receiving energy head-on and other parts are like the poles are not okay however in their own model the big bang model of the sun that is just not possible every square inch of the earth should receive nearly an equal amount of energy the earth should be wrapped like living in a sauna okay that's how the earth should be from the top to the bottom it should all 
be soaking and sweating in heat if the sun was really that big. But now they have suddenly shrunken the sun. This is the NASA website again I'm showing you. You know, the sun has really shrunk. It's become smaller and the earth. So the people will say, oh, but the sun is 93 million miles away. So it's 150 kilometers, a million kilometers away. So it becomes smaller. Well, yes, if the sun became small like that, the earth would not be, should, should the earth not also proportionally become smaller? Do you understand what I'm saying? So what they've done is they've shrunk the sun, but kept the earth of the same dimensions that it is. And in that model, yes, this direct, indirect sunrise and all that kind of works, but not in the gigantic sun model. You know, continuing here, you can see more, moreover again, like, you know, in all these models, which are trying to explain these things, the sun has suddenly, you know, it, it shrinks, 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 becomes smaller, 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 smaller. Like, the, you know, here's one here, right here, example. Again, the small sun, big earth. But, which is the only way to explain these phenomena. It, it is necessary for these phenomena to be properly scientifically explained. It is necessary that the sun be small and the earth be big. That is necessary. It's a fundamental necessity. All right, moving right along. So the question that I'm asking in this video is, why is uh, the hottest time of the day around 2, 3 in the afternoon? So here we have this, uh, the old farmer's, farmer's almanac on their website. There's a question, what is the hottest time of day, 3 p.m. or noon? And so the hottest time of the day is around 3 p.m. Heat continues building up afternoon when the sky, sun is highest in the sky, as long as more heat is arriving at the earth than leaving. By 3 p.m. or so, the sun is low enough in the sky for the outgoing heat to be greater than incoming. Since the hottest time is earlier, sometimes the hottest time is earlier because the weather system moves in with the cool air early in the day. Okay, we'll come back and visit this answer, okay, and see what the problem is with this. And there's more here, you know, like this. This is a good question that somebody's asked on this website, and it says, Hi, why is the sun hotter in the middle of the day than in the morning or the evening? I have a problem. He's a smart guy. I have a problem buying the argument about the dif distance difference, which says that the sun is closer to the Earth's surface that is at 90 degrees to its rays than the surface, which is at less degrees. Why? Because the difference is negligible considering how far the Earth is from the sun. And that's what I've been, uh, you know, repeatedly telling you that, you know, that the, the, uh, the, the top to the bottom you know, you have a distance of maximum distance of around 10,000 kilometers, around 6,000 miles. That is nothing in relation to the size of the sun and particularly in relation to the size of the sphere of energy that surrounds the sun. OK, it is nothing that is hardly from if you were to observe the Earth from the sun. OK, like you would see that the Earth would be like flat, like a quarter. OK, that's how how little the curve would be in comparison to the sun itself. And we're just talking about the sun, not even talking about the volume and the size of the energy bubble that surrounds the sun. I have problem understanding the other argument that says that the rays cut the atmosphere at a 90 degrees and thus is less resistive to heat and that another part of the atmosphere which is cut at a less angle. Why? Because the atmosphere is gas and the gas does not have access to reference a degree of 90 from. Good question, buddy. Good question. Okay, exactly my point. And then here's more. You know, why is it hotter during the afternoon, 2, 3 p.m. than it is at noon, even when the rays from the sun do have to travel a shorter distance at noon? And again, like that guy in the previous question, he asked that. You know, he said that that really is when you understand the big picture. This distance is a uh, factor. Is basically, uh, it's a smoke screen. Okay, it's a red herring. So here's, a, here's an answer, okay, from a guy who's an inventor, a mechanical engineer, musician, patrol head, whatever that means, any physics freak, etc., etc., etc. At 12, the Earth's crust is only superficially heated as the materials such as soil, grass, etc., are bad conductors of heat. Supply more heat for a couple of more hours, and the Earth's surface absorbs and retains heat. Keep that in mind. Absorbs and retains heat. The heat is slowly radiating out, causing an increase in temperature. In short, at 12 noon, you only feel the sun's heat, whereas at 3 p.m., you feel the sun's heat plus heat, which is being given off by the Earth. 
Okay. So basically, what they're saying is that from the morning till about three in the afternoon, there's a heat gain, which makes sense. Okay. But what does not make sense is why does the heat gain stop at 3 p.m.? Why does it not keep on gaining heat right until the time that the sun sets? And now let me show you a couple of images and then you will understand why this is a problem that, uh, you know, the hottest part of the day is around 2, 3 in the afternoon, whereas in this big sun solar system model, the heat should continue to gain as long as the sun is shining, as long as the surface is facing the sun, the side that is facing the sun, it should keep on gaining heat all through the day, right up until the point of time that it, it goes out of the sun's light and heat. Okay, let me tell you why. A day on Earth is a deceivingly simple concept. Today we'll examine that day on Earth in detail perhaps uncovering a few surprises. A day is the length of time it takes the Earth to spin 360 degrees on its axis. Or is it 361? Here is a simple model showing the Earth, the Sun, and some background stars. The Earth travels around the Sun in an ellipse, with the Sun at one focus. The model, of course, is not to scale. Let's begin our examination at noon one day. The sun is directly above the red line. That will be our reference point. Watching from a high vantage point, we see the Earth complete 360 degrees of rotation. But during that time, the Earth has also moved a bit in its orbit. So even after a 360 degree turn, the Sun is not directly above the same point on Earth that it was at the beginning of the spin. It is not noon of the next day. The red reference line needs to spin a little more than 360 degrees to get us to noon. The 360 degree rotation is called a sidereal day, while the noon to noon rotation is called a solar day. That was a short animated video, you know, to give us a refresher on uh, how uh, they allegedly works on uh, a spinning globe uh, around a massive sun model. And uh, right now we won't concern ourselves with things such as the sidereal day, but uh, just with the solar day. Okay, so this graphic that you're looking at on the screen shows, you know, that uh, the when the Earth is, it shows the rotation. Okay, it is it is rotating from east to west, and uh, it shows the axis, and it also shows the sun rays that are lighting up one side of the earth, uh, and uh, that is the side that is in the daylight. Now again, like you know, as you will notice uh, here carefully, that the red arrows, uh, this is the amount of sunlight uh, that is allegedly arriving at the earth, and once again, it is cut off right from the pole to pole, and no more. But of course, if you kept in mind that uh, the width, the main width, let's say, of this uh, sunlight would be like, you know, multiple times the width of the Earth, it would be like massive. Uh, it'll be like, uh, you know, when you when you uh, see in movies, you see a blast wave, you know, which is coming, or in movies like uh, Deep Impact, you know, the, the tidal wave is coming into it, just gets higher and higher, higher, sweeps everything in its path. That literally is how the sun's energy should be, that it is coming and it's going to blast everything in its path very directly, and if the Earth is just a tiny little object, you know, it's going to have no problem uh, covering it from pole to pole and going all the way around it. Okay, now we're not going to concern with all that for the moment as to, you know, what the, the, the subject addressed last week about uh, there should be no polar ice caps. Now I want to concern ourselves more with the uh, subject of the axis of rotation. Most people think that this, uh, this axis is something that is factual. It is anything but that, okay? This axis is uh, the 23.5 degree axis uh, at which the Earth is allegedly tilted. It is just an arbitrary number, okay? Which uh, is uh, absolutely subjective. There is 
because you see the only way that this uh, axis could be absolute is that if you were to take say an axle and you know put it through the s center of the earth right into the sun so that it only would be able to spin around that axis then we could say it's 23.5 degrees but in an object that is free floating like the earth allegedly is it has an infinite number of axes okay for example the dotted line the blue dotted line that you're looking at is a perpendicular axis and this is what we're going to concern with ourselves with today because what this perpendicular axis does is that it splits the earth into two hemispheres an east hemisphere and a west hemisphere we have been so conditioned to think in terms of north and south hemispheres only that we really don't think in terms of the east and the west hemisphere and what it means to the uh, phenomena such as day and night length and particularly and also about seasons so let me just show you what the significance of this is okay you know the real reason for this uh, coming up with this hypothesis of the 23.5 degree tilt uh, at which the alleged axis of the earth is tilted is because these phenomena like the difference in the length of day and night the difference in uh, conditions in different parts of the earth at different times of the year it cannot be explained in the otherwise if the earth is always perpendicular to the sun now they can be explained regardless okay that's if you look at this the object if you look at the screen this revisit this image of the size of the sun as compared to the earth which is the bottom you know in this picture really it doesn't matter which way the axis is which way the earth is rotating which way it's spinning as long as it's facing the side that is facing the sun it is going to receive a uniform amount of energy from the sun there is no other possibility and if that is the case if this is truly the case then all these things like the length of day and night it should be equal the uh, there should be no seasons on the earth that also is very easy to see and therefore in order to explain these things how they happen which they know as would be otherwise impossible this hypothesis was developed that the earth is actually tilted but let's now take a look at another graphic to understand that no matter which degree they say the earth is tilted the earth is always going to have a perpendicular axis as it faces the sun and that perpendicular axis is going to divide the earth into two hemispheres the east and the west the day and the night the dark and the light and it is going to do so equally okay so this tilt as we shall see is soon going to become very very irrelevant now as is very easy to see from the graphic on the screen if we think forget ignore that uh, tilted axis for a minute look at that dotted blue line which is the perpendicular axis and uh, as this earth the site that is facing the Sun which in this case happens to be the Americas and you can see that they are receiving light from the Sun right from the top of North America right down to the bottom to Antarctica okay now so this is the axis around which this earth is going to rotate facing the Sun is going to be this blue axis okay so this is the perpendicular axis around which this is going to spin in the blue arrow direction and uh, then it'll be uh, it but but the point here is that right from the top Okay, let's say the top where we have North America is now let's call it the North Pole because this alleged tilt and uh, the bottom Antarctica would be the south that whole 180 degrees is now in the daylight right it's easy to see that so it has come around to face the Sun so it's in the daylight so it's going to be daylight from the top to the bottom but 
we understand right now at this very moment in time look at that top arrow it'll be pointing somewhere towards uh, the top of north america right you know maybe around where seattle vancouver is and down uh, the, the bottom arrow at the the red arrow would be pointing towards antarctica okay now in this model if this is the half the eastern let's say the western hemisphere right now that is in daylight is it not plain to see that right from the very top to the very bottom it should be that that the whole hemisphere should stay in daylight for an equal period of time that the length of day in seattle vancouver should be the same length as it is at the very bottom tip of south america or even towards antarctica where at this point in time it will be the daylight would be something you know close, approaching 20 hours but up towards seattle vancouver it will be around 10 hours so the length of day at the bottom is double what it is at the top how is that possible okay did we not did i not show you that before that uh let's go back and actually look at it right now all right here we go the sun and its energy this measure simply means that on average one square meter on the side of the earth facing the sun receives energy from the sun okay the side the of the earth facing the sun receives energy from the sun the whole side not just the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere the side facing is the eastern hemisphere or the western hemisphere so in this case since it is the western hemisphere that is in the sunlight the top to the bottom should receive an equal amount of sunlight and therefore there should be an equal length of day and night on there and this is also going to prove something else now we're going to talk about uh, noon time like you know why does it get hot in the noon time in this model it should not and let me show you why okay before i talk about why the afternoon early afternoon is the hottest time of the day uh let me just finish off with this idea of the day and night okay now people are going to start talking about the tilt and i can understand that that what this alleged tilt is doing is okay that over six months if we were to look at the equator on the globe model okay for the northern half that is in winter for six months the area that was previously north of the equator it shrinks by 23 and a half degrees so the top half it now goes away allegedly from the sun and the bottom half moves into the sun so essentially the area that was south of the equator it becomes greater than is north of the equator that's understandable fair enough but the point is that still there is 180 degrees that from top to bottom and that still includes a substantial area of the north as well okay it is not just just the southern hemisphere is now in the sun and in the heat a substantial part of the north still is and the reverse happens six months later where the northern side above the equator increases but the southern decreases but any of the areas that lie between 66.5 degrees of latitude north or latitude south they are always going to be a part of that eastern or western hemisphere which is always going to face the sun and therefore they must always be equal in the length of their days as well as in the seasons that they experience within those latitudes we don't see that happening therefore this model is an impossibility all right so let's just take another look at this uh, old farmers almanac website and this is the answer to the question what is the hottest time of day 3 p.m or noon by the way i did a search on this on youtube you know there's nothing on there no, no very strange that you know these kind of phenomenon very little explanation there are some videos that explain seasons but they you know the length of day and night for example there's no explanations 
there's no explanations about why it's hot uh, you know two three in the afternoon nothing like that nothing very little information on the internet okay and why perhaps because they don't have any straight answers that's why anyways the question is what is the hottest time of day 3 p.m. or noon the hottest time of the day is around 3 p.m. heat continues building up afternoon when the Sun is highest in the sky that in itself is a little bit of a problematic situation because if the earth is facing the sun you know it should always be at a constant distance okay and even though it's rotating the distance should not be changed we should not really be seeing the sun get smaller and bigger you should just come into view and then it should just go out of view okay when the sun is highest in the sky as long as more heat is arriving the earth than leaving so that is the answer he said by 3 p.m. or so the sun is low enough in the sky for outgoing heat to be greater than incoming now let's just question if that is even remotely possible now the picture on the screen is a screenshot i took of uh, from the video that i played earlier that uh, did a animation of how day and night happen on the earth okay and in this year you can see that the earth is facing the sun and if you were to draw a line through the top of the earth to the bottom of the earth you know you could have you could create a perpendicular axis and I told you that the axes are just arbitrary and there's always going to be a perpendicular axis which is going to separate the earth and divide it into two hemispheres an eastern and a, and a western hemisphere so let's say at this point in time it's the western hemisphere that is facing the Sun it is it is just morning and it is just coming to the light first of all I liked uh, this animation enough that they showed the Sun to be fairly big although they did admit that it was not to scale so this earth is still way too big but anyhow but it gives you a very generally good idea that you know whatever sunlight is going to be coming and whatever <coughs> heat is going to be coming it is going to not only cover the entire earth there's going to be plenty of it left to go above and below it into the space beyond all right so soon as it comes into light soon as it begins to face the sun it was facing away from the sun to the dark side where you see the stars etc right now on your right and as soon as it begins to face the sun the heat begins to build okay so it's the light won't really change during the day it should not change in this model because once it comes into light the distance from the sun is not going to change during the day it is going to stay relatively the same and the amount of light that the sun is going to be emitting is not going to change that is going to remain relatively the same so there should be very little variation in the amount of light that it's going to receive but the heat will definitely change and there's a reasons for it like they explain you know that the that the ground heats up the air heats up and the longer it stays facing the sun the hotter it'll get so we are told that uh, the noon time is the hottest actually temperature wise I mean it is supposed to be the hottest time of the day when the earth is directly facing the Sun now how you know they determine that in this model I don't understand to me once it comes to face it is facing it until it doesn't face it okay so it should be basically noon hour all day long anyhow so the heat begins to build so then we are told that you know at 12 o'clock is uh, high noon like we are but you always hear and uh, then uh, for a couple more hours like the farmers almanac told us and a lot of other websites will that the heat will continue to build for till about two three in the afternoon and after that it'll begin to dissipate the question is why would it begin to dissipate if it is still facing the Sun if the hemisphere is still in front of the Sun should it not keep on receiving heat until actually goes and turns its face away see when it begins to come into view let's say seven in the morning okay the heat begins to build immediately and you guys know that in the summertime you know as soon as the sun shines and then the dew disappears everything begins to heat up immediately even by nine o'clock you start getting hotter and ten and it gets hotter 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 all right so then as the farmers almanac said you know after three o'clock it starts reversing but my question is how how it actually should keep on increasing because let's say that seven in the morning it was 60 degrees Fahrenheit okay somewhere in the 20 or 15 degrees Celsius or so let's stay with Fahrenheit for a minute so it was 60 degrees Fahrenheit and by 1 2 in the afternoon the temperature has everything has heated up enough the ground has heated up the air has heated up so that the temperature now stands at 90 okay so essentially by that time 
the hemisphere that was facing the sun has completed only half its rotation. Okay, only half the day has gone by. It still has to complete the other half. So in that half of that rotation, the temperature went up by 30 degrees. So when it gets to the middle point, okay, 3 p.m., the starting temperature now is 90 degrees, not 60 degrees, okay? So what is it that makes it start to cool down? If all the factors remain the same, it is still facing the sun, the still the distance is still the same, all the other conditions are still the same, except it is much hotter. Does it not make sense that it covers the other half of its rotation? the other half of the arc that has not yet gone beyond the light of the sun into darkness, that the heat should continue to build, that from 90 degrees it should go up to 100, 110 maybe, by the time the sun finally sets, as they say, which means that the hemisphere completely turns away from facing the sun and is facing the opposite direction. Does that make sense to you, that... In this model, once the hemisphere comes into view of the sun, it should immediately begin to receive, start receiving light and heat, and should continue to receive an equal amount of light and heat for the entire time that it is facing the sun. And because as that heat will continue to build, okay, it is going to build because of the ground temperatures will rise, the water temperatures will rise, the air temperatures will rise that the addition of heat is going to be greater than the dissipation of it through the entire time that it will face the sun. So therefore, the hottest part of the day should be the evening just before the sunset. And even if the sun has set, because there will be so much heat that will be retained by the ground, etc., it should stay hot well into like the early hours of the next morning and the coolest part of the day should be just before sunrise when there has enough time has passed that the face of the the, the, the rotation has taken uh, the the hemisphere away from facing the sun to the completely the opposite side so there's sufficient time goes by and now there has been enough time for the temperatures to cool down but once again as soon as it comes back into facing the sun the same phenomenon should be repeated again it should start heating up the moment it faces it and it should continue until the time that the face is completely disappears into the dark side it cannot there cannot be any time any hour that the energy that the face side, side facing the sun, the hemisphere facing the sun, will be less than the energy that is being dissipated, not in this model. All right, so the disingenuity of these cartoons that are uh, used by NASA, so-called science, you know, these are the top scientists in the world at the teaching at MIT and Harvard and everything else is that they use these cartoons to try and explain things like, you know, the length of day and night, seasons, etc. to you. But if you look at their cartoon, which is that, you know, spinning globe with these rays of sun hitting it, what they show you is that, you know, the sun rays, they just barely make, get to the poles, okay? That's it. That there's no more sunlight left to go above the earth and below the earth, which it should. Because when you look at the reality of what they also tell us, that you know the sun is so gigantic and the earth is so small, that this is what should happen. You can see the blue arrow. That is basically an axis that should run right through the middle of the sun, right through the middle of the earth, which means that the earth should always be facing the sun dead smack in the middle, and half of the earth should always be right in front of the sun. Okay. So this sunlight that is shown in this NASA, you know, so-called science uh, graphic, this sunlight should extend like way above and way below. Well, what problem would that create then? The problem that would be created then is that there should be no dark spots on the earth. In the, in the summer, we are told, you know, in the wintertime in the north, that up above by Alaska or something, that there's going to be no sunlight left. It's going to be totally in the dark, like in Norway, etc. Well, why? 
Why, my friends, if the sun is so much bigger and the earth is so much smaller, as you can see here where the arrow is, that if, if this was drawn to scale and this earth that I'm showing you is still not to scale, it is still bigger than it should be. Okay, It is like putting the earth inside of a sauna. And are you going to tell me that the top half is not going to get any heat or light? and the bottom half won't, it'll only be concentrated on certain parts at one, the side that is facing the sun. Okay, we are not talking about the other side, the side that is facing the sun, okay? In this, you can see here, like in this uh, where the red arrow is, the bigger earth that they've been using, it uh, doesn't matter if it's the north side or the south side, should they not be getting an equal amount of energy, whether it's light or heat? It should be, if this model was correct. But their model where, you know, the whole of the sunlight does not even reach whole of the earth is only possible if the earth is much bigger than the sun, which it just happens to be. Okay, let me explain this problem using a protractor, which some of you might have seen in a geometry class a long time ago. Anyhow, what this really shows you is that uh, the model of day and night. Okay, as I told you, if you split the earth into two hemispheres, which it does when the sun is when the earth is facing the sun it naturally splits into two hemispheres with a perpendicular axis okay so 90 degrees so basically the 180 degrees is the perpendicular axis and the the journey of this protractor if you imagine it's spinning around on that axis it has to go from zero all the way to 180 okay so it begins at zero, the zero degrees is the first one that comes into the sunlight. And 90 degrees, let's say, is the middle. So if the day is, say, 12 hours long, and the sun rose at six o'clock in the morning, then 90 degrees will be reached at 12 noon. So half the day will have gone by, and it will have been facing the sun for a period of six hours. So that journey from zero to 90, what's happening is there's being a heat buildup, right? Why? Because the earth began to face the sun. That's why, no other reason. The question is when it goes from 90 to 180, okay, which is the same arc as the one from zero to 90, why should the heat begin to go down? In this model, it should not happen. It should continue to build all the way from 90 to 180, right? Because let's think of it in reverse. Let's go from 180 to 90. Is that not exactly the same as what would happen from zero to 90, right? It's the same phenomenon should be experienced. And that is the reason why until all 180 degrees have not passed the face of the sun, the heat will continue to build and it should keep on getting hotter and hotter and hotter until the hemisphere is no longer facing the sun. That is the only conclusion that is reasonable, that is logical, that is scientific that we can draw based upon the models which are given to us by our educators, by our authorities, so to speak, by those big organizations such as NASA. They give us the information. We are now analyzing the information and these are the conclusions we are drawing. At least that is the only conclusion that I can draw that the hardest part of the day should be just before sunset, no, and no earlier than that. Okay, in this uh, conclusion, what I want to say is, in this uh, picture that you're looking at on the screen, which is very common, and you know, you can Google it, and you'll see that, you know, earth and uh, sun to scale, etc. If this was, if this information was correct, the earth will always be dead smack in the middle of the sun, and the sun's energy will not just be hitting the top of the bottom of the earth, it'll be hitting everywhere and a hundred earths above, sorry, 50 earths above it and 50 earths below it. 
So like the most of the energy that was going to be directed towards the earth is actually going to bypass the earth. There's so much of it. It's like you'll be swimming in the ocean and oceans. It's like dropping a pebble into the Pacific Ocean and not expecting it, one part of it to get wet. It's impossible. Okay. Therefore, any side that's facing the earth is going to get an equal amount of sunlight. Doesn't matter if it's at the North Pole or if it's at the South Pole. Okay, it'll get an equal amount of sunlight and will also get an equal amount of heat. So therefore, this difference in temperature that we see at the North and South, it is an impossibility in this model. Just think about it. Thank you for listening. This is Paul Sandu. Salvation is so 